Hi, welcome back. I'm Terry Burns, and this is a supplementary advanced class that is part of my larger class on the hieroglyphic monad or monus hieroglyphica of Dr. John D. using the translation that Dr. Nancy Turner and I made that came out from Oboros Press a couple of years ago. Once we got through to theorem 14, I said I would be talking about some of the references to physical alchemy in the work. And that's what I'm going to do here. Now, you don't need to understand this to understand the monad. And this is an advanced class, as I said. So I'm assuming that you know who John D is, you know what the hieroglyphic monad is. But beyond that, that you have been studying along through the hieroglyphic monad and you understand it through theorem 14. If not, I'd love to have you join the class. The playlist is below, but a lot of this will not make sense if you don't have that background. So let me go ahead and jump in here. And if there's anyone left after that little disclaimer, we'll uh, keep going. So you remember in theorem 13D talked about inferior astronomy. And I said that the definition of that didn't seem to fit and that it was common in physical alchemy. That's what we're going to talk about here. And we're going to use as an example, George Ripley's compound of alchemy and the Ripley wheel in there. Uh, we're going to do that because by the time you get to the end of this century, particularly like the 1590s, the physical alchemist most associated with John D is Ripley. And I will argue in a moment here why D would have known Ripley's work as early as when D is writing the hieroglyphic monad. But here is that graphic that you had back in Theorem 13, and he's labeled it the original monadic anatomy of the entire realm of inferior astronomy. That's sometimes called interior or lower astronomy also. And as I discussed in that theorem, inferior astronomy, whether you're looking at things geocentrically or heliocentrically, does not include some of these planets that he is like Saturn, um, Jupiter, and Mars. The idea in astronomy of inferior astronomy is to explain an epicycle that is, it, it's used to calculate retrograde motion and it's only used for Venus and Mercury, which we now know, and I think Dee knew just as well, that they are closer to the sun than earth. But Mathematically, you calculate an epicycle the same way, whether you are looking at things heliocentrically or geocentrically, and you're doing this to understand the retrograde motion of Venus and Mercury. It has nothing to do with, for example, Saturn, Jupiter, or Mars. So why is he using that term? And we looked at all of that, as you know, in terms of what planets would you associate with what Sephiroth and that he is having you go back up the tree and we could talk about it in terms of what it's interior to in terms of the tree of life. Okay, but that's not particularly how most people think physical alchemists were using it. Also, you remember at the end of theorem 12, we have that smaller graphic that you see at the bottom there. And Dee was talking about revolutions. It seemed three revolutions, and we discussed it in great world ages, but he said if there was a fourth, it wouldn't be contrary to his proposition. And then you get this fifth thing. And that's really similar to the four rotations that make the circle round that physical alchemists use. So these are the questions we're going to explore in this advanced class. First of all, what is Ripley's wheel? Um, why do some people consider it a guide to this and other works of Ripley's? The main person who does, by the way, is Jennifer Rampling. Um, and I totally agree with her analysis. Um, what does inferior astronomy mean in physical alchemy? And could D have known Ripley's work in 1564? And of course he could, or I wouldn't be talking about it here. And I'll tell you how right now. I think it's time to just abandon once and for all the very unhelpful idea that because a book is not in John D's library catalog, he doesn't know it. I mean, nobody else is held to this standard, but it's like, gee, he's got the biggest library in England. So if it's not in his library, he hasn't read it, which is an absurd idea. So the compound of alchemy, by the way, isn't in my library here, but I'm going to give you a presentation on part of it. 
a lot of works are also dangerous to have. So we know now that Dee had a lot of works that he didn't list in his library catalog. One I've mentioned is the Codex Marcianus. I've also mentioned that he certainly had to know Reuchlin's Art of Kabbalah because he has other works of Reuchlin. He has, for example, well, he also has other works of Riccio, who is, is um, Reuchlin's main Kabbalistic source. So we know that Dee, like every other human I have known, probably read a lot of books that don't show up in his library catalog and Ripley is one of them. Why would he be interested in Ripley? Well, he seems interested in almost everything, but if he is gonna be interested in even one English alchemist, it would be Ripley. Because Ripley is the first English alchemist to achieve the Philosopher's Stone, according to people who write about Ripley. So now when we see how Ripley is using it, there will be a direct carryover to how you make magical seals. So those of you interested in ceremonial magic um, who know of things like Dee's seal of Amet later in his Enochian work will want to note how that is. All right, here's John Dee, you know this guy, and over here is George Ripley. This is a picture of George Ripley on another of his works called Ripley's Scroll, which is a fascinating work of physical alchemy. And here's the same picture of Ripley, all pretty prettied up by someone for Wikipedia. Let's talk a little bit about Ripley's life. And what I'm saying here is based um, on some work done by Stanton Linden. And I'll give you the citation for that at the end, as well as some other things you may find helpful if you're doing advanced work on this. Again, Ripley is one of the few English alchemists reputed to have achieved the Philosopher's Stone, the others being Thomas Norton and Edward Kelly. John Dee and Elias Ashmole say they've had the secret open to them. Dee says this in his diary right before he and Kelly part ways in 1589, and Elias Ashmole says it in Ashmole's diary that his Rosicrucian father, William Backhouse, has opened the secret of the Philosopher's Stone. But the three people who have actually done it according to what others say about it is Ripley, Norton, and Kelly. So back to Ripley. In the late Middle Ages in England, Ripley is, has left England and is traveling around on the European continent. Of note, while it's still the late Middle Ages in England, the Italian Renaissance has started further south. It takes almost 100 years for that to spread, some of those ideas to spread north. Um, John Leland later says that Ripley learned the secret of projection in Italy. Ripley visits Rhodes, he lives with the Knights of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, then he returns to England in 1471 and writes The Compound of Alchemy. He also writes a guide to works attributed to Raymond Lull, who is probably the alchemist who is second most associated with the work of Dee and Kelly, because in the 1580s, almost two decades after the hieroglyphic monad, um, Dee will become interested in physical alchemy, but this is supplemental material to my class on the monad. And in 1564, there's no evidence that he is doing physical alchemy experiments. For one thing, he's traveling around way too much. Back to Ripley, Ripley returns to Italy. He writes some verses. He's made a chamberlain by the Pope. He returns to England in 1478 in possession of the secret of transmutation or how to project the philosopher's stone. He becomes a Carmelite and in 1490, he dies. Here's a... Uh, picture of the cover of the first English translation. The one in 1471 was in, uh, in Latin, of course. And so this is very associated with Dee and Kelly, among others. There's a poem in it that is about Dee. There is a poem by Sir Edward Kelly. In fact, I'll, send, I'll put a link in below here to analysis I did of that because it's fascinating, this poem that Kelly writes, and it's been reprinted several times since then. But here's what Ripley says. Um, this is a compound of alchemy dedicated to King Edward IV. Edward IV, like Elizabeth I, is very supportive of alchemy and esoterica in general, more than rulers before or after. The king, his vision, his wheel, that's what we're looking at here, and his other works. Also, this is kind of cool. Look at this word up here, alchemy. I'd forgotten that this was um, on the cover page of the first English translation of the Compound of Alchemy, but you saw this word in uh, the Voarchidumi of Panteo or Pantheus, right? And it's this word that 
that Panteo, most people think he made up. Um, it is basically um, something like alchemy, except you're not being as corrupt as alchemists anyway. That would be fun to explore more if we were going to explore the whole compound of alchemy, but we're not. And one reason is, the only reason uh, I'm talking about this now is this supplemental material for my class on the hieroglyphic monad. Maybe we'll get into the compound of alchemy later. It's a fascinating work. Here is a digital copy from the University of Cambridge of that 1591 translation. It's difficult to look at, but it's easier to look at this one than the one that is in Latin. If you want to see that, I would recommend uh, Rampling's article. Let me read a little bit about what the University of Cambridge says about Ripley's wheel here, and then we're gonna go back and look at the uh, hieroglyphic monad in a couple of slides. In his famous alchemical text, The Compound of Alchemy, George Ripley made use of a complex alchemical image, the wheel, to convey the subtleties of his art. The quadripartite wheel, composed of concentric spheres with captions and verses, embodied a variety of sophisticated alchemical ideas and procedures, and was therefore an important visual reference for the reader of the compound. Within its concentric spheres, the wheel tabulated information about a variety of natural philosophical and alchemical phenomena. The four Aristotelian elements, stop. Note this as Aristotelian. With D, we've been talking about him as a Neoplatonist and how he is leaning on works of Plato's like the Timaeus and the different references of the Platonic elements and Platonic solids. Now, the elements are the same with Plato and Aristotle. What's different is what they are, what they correspond to. And we could do a whole thing on that if we wanted, but let's not. Let's keep going. Um, the Aristotelian elements and their qualities are incorporated along with the compass point, seasons, dimension, signs of the zodiac, and medical virtues. Other more specifically alchemical detail was also provided, such as the four metallic bodies used in Ripley's alchemy, the sun, moon, Venus, and Mercury, equating to gold, silver, copper, mercury, along with the proportions of each to be used in alchemical preparations skip down here to the bottom. By representing this information in the form of a circular diagram, Ripley's wheel could be used to explain alchemical transformations. For instance, circular forms were familiar tropes used to denote the squaring of the circle, the transformation of the four Aristotelian elements. All right. The squaring of the circle of the four Aristotelian elements, keep in mind, is different from the problem the, one of the three classic problems of ancient Greek geometry, the squaring of the circle, the doubling of the cube and the trisecting of the angle. Now look what's popped up on the bottom here. This is from theorem 18 of the hieroglyphic monad. Looks similar to what's in the middle there. It looks very similar. You can hardly miss it. And the four rotations D is doing that he talked about um, in 12 will reappear here in 18. You have the first rotation there of Saturn, then Jupiter, then the moon, then Mercury. Now, what would be really cool is if the order of planets D is using match the order Ripley is using, but they don't match. And in fact, Ripley uses different orders and then you can blame some of that later, uh, a third order to maybe scribal error, but Anyway, it doesn't match D. At least it doesn't match D all the time in any way that helps us shed light on either work in my not so humble opinion about that. So let's look at what Ripley's wheel is. As I noted, it's that circular diagram. But let's, if you look at it as a key to the whole of the compound of alchemy, which is what Jennifer Rampling does, it makes more sense because the dominant metaphor of that whole work doesn't really relate to the verses inside. Ripley's compound of alchemy is not a set of, of scientific instructions. It's verses about the process of alchemical transformation. So there's this beautiful governing metaphor of a huge castle with 12 gates. Think 12 signs of the zodiac, 12 months of the year, any 12 that uh, tickles your fancy, but in particular, he has 12 stages of alchemical transformation running from calcination to projection. And Rampling says that he's borrowed that from another alchemical work, the Scala Philosophorum or the Ladder of the Philosophers. The um, self-description of the compound gives a date of 1471. That's the year Edward IV is restored to the throne. And I've noted before already that the first English translation in 1591 has a poem that seems about D and another by Edward Kelly. 
there will be yet another version of the wheel uh, and, and the compound of alchemy in Elias Ashmole's Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum. Now, remember, we have three people who have achieved the projection of the Philosopher's Stone, Ripley, Norton, and Kelly, and then two others who have said they've had it explained to them, D and Ashmole. So another version appears in the Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum put together by Ashmole, which also has a lot of other material about D and Kelly's continental adventures in the 1580s, although interestingly, it has nothing about the Monus Hieroglyphica. Rampling's 2013 article is one I'm going to be leaning on fairly heavily for everything I say about Ripley from here on. Um, she talks about George Ripley's Wheel of Inferior Astronomy, and she views this wheel rather than, say, the 12 rungs of a ladder or the 12 gates of a castle to be the key to understanding Ripley's work. So let me just quote from her um, abstract and then something longer that comes later on in the article. She says, in the concentric circles of his lower astronomy, lower, inferior, interior, all mean the same thing, Ripley provided a terrestrial analog for the planetary spheres. That is what D does also. Those of you that are ceremonial magicians, if, if you charge seals using a griffin magic, you are doing something similar to what D is doing. Probably not to what Ripley is doing, but that's another whole topic. So it's a terrestrial analog for planetary spheres. Let's go down here and read a further articulation of that from later in her article. Alchemical writing, she says, often develops the idea of a physical or analogical correspondence between heaven and earth. Well, what did we just see in theorem 14? A restatement of the Emerald Tablet of thrice great Hermes, as above, so below. So an analogical correspondence, or in the Emerald Tablet, a literal correspondence. Anyway, this relationship is most frequently and conveniently expressed by the use of seven planetary symbols, Sol, Luna, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, same one D uses, to denote the seven metals, usually gold, silver, quicksilver, copper, iron, tin, and lead. You can apply that to that correspondence to these also if you want. So such correspondences need not have immediate practical implications. Rather, the presentation of alchemy as a terrestrial or inferior analog to celestial astronomy suggested a framework within which alchemical transmutation was both possible and compatible with an established worldview, particularly the idea of seven classical planets and so on. So here is that graphic again that was at the end of theorem 12. D calls this for geogamic theorems. Remember what he means by geogamic or how he has defined it, gamea or gamos gaian in his letter to Maximilian. I'll put in a link to that below or earth of marriage. He's in effect defining these as magical seals, things that are charged by celestial light or divine light. Now, in his letter to Maximilian, we've also seen that he's talking about making the circle round. And in the context, it most clearly um, alludes to the Greek geometric problem of squaring the circle, as I've already mentioned here, the three problems, squaring the circle, doubling the cube, trisecting the angle. But it is a very common trope in physical alchemy as well. Um, metaphorically, you turn the circle 90 degrees four times, or you square it, or you turn the square four times and you've inscribed a circle, however you want to think about it, and you have the quintessence um, or the philosopher's stone. In fact, in the very center of Ripley's wheel, it says kind of twined around so it's hard to look at in the, the Latin um, original, uh, something that is translated into the 1590 one and by Ashmole has, when thou hast made the quadrangle round, then is all the secret found. So in the same article of Ramplings I've been talking about, she says that wheels and circles are familiar tropes of medieval alchemy. Now, Burns adds, and magic circles go back to antiquity, right? But what is D doing in the Renaissance in terms of magic? And not just D, but many people who we might now call ceremonial magicians. He's trying to clean up using the thought of um, Renaissance Neoplatonism and using the Kabbalah, these forms that have deteriorated, okay? So 
that's what I've been showing you that D is doing. But these same circles show up all through medieval alchemy, um, often denoting the squaring of the circle, the transformation of the four Aristotelian elements. Now, whether this transformation of the Aristotelian elements is the same thing as the elementata that I've talked about, that's another whole big topic for another time too. But an element, as Rampling explains, changes when its previous form is destroyed and it assumes another through the substitution of its primary elementary qualities. So earth, which is associated with cold and dry, becomes water associated with cold and moist but by losing its dryness. And then water becomes air, which is hot and moist, has coldness yields to heat. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they're also associated with cyclic transformations in works of Raymond Lull, who is, as I mentioned, the physical alchemist next most associated with John Dee and Edward Kelly a couple decades after the hieroglyphic monad is written. So we looked at Dee's three and four revolutions in terms of great world ages, but I also told you we could connect it to Ripley and his alchemical idea of the making the circle round. So that's what we're doing. In this theorem, um, D says, so long as the purest magical spirit will superintend the work of the whitening in the place of the moon and by means of spiritual virtue itself, it may without words speak hieroglyphically alone with us through nearly the middle of the natural day, introducing and imprinting into the most pure and simple earth, that which we have prepared, those four geogamic figures, these, or in their stead, that other figure. So D is talking about magical seals the same way that a physical alchemist talks about making the circle round in effect. So if you look at his sequence of the planets in theorem 13, he's calling it inferior astronomy, not because he means what astronomers mean, but because he's talking about things here below receiving the divine light from above, as above, so below. And he's looking at them in, as magical seals. And he's already described that in the opening. He's called the hieroglyphic monad um, glyph that he's taking apart and putting together his hermetic seal. So he is inviting you to look at his corrected glyphs of the planets as magical seals, just as he's called the monad a seal, Gamos Gaian. And a lot of you interested in Dee's later works knows he uses seals. You probably know his most famous seal from, oh, more than 15 years later, um, the seal of the truth of God, or Segelum DMF. It comes years later, and it's considered by some people to be a condensation of medieval planetary magic not physical alchemy, medieval planetary magic, but he's using the language of physical alchemy. If you look at these glyphs, uh, these show up in theorem 18, and if you're in my class, we'll get to them in a few more weeks. Um, here is that spiral I showed you before, and here is an egg. Oh, an egg. Is an Orboros serpent going to spring forth from it? A hermetic egg is also a common symbol, and look at uh, the order here. We'll, when we get to theorem 18, we'll talk about how one of these transforms into the other. But it's hard to not miss the similarity between these two, Ripley's wheel or the interior part of Ripley's wheel and D's spiral. So what should one take away from this rather advanced class of supplemental material in looking at the hieroglyphic monad. Well, D uses the term interior astronomy in a manner similar to physical alchemists, especially similar to that of George Ripley. Ripley later becomes associated with the work of John D and Edward Kelly, largely because of Kelly's success with physical alchemy. And this is according to Rampling, and I'll give you the citation at the, uh, in the final slide here. But that doesn't mean that D isn't aware of the work long before that. D and the monad is using the language of physical alchemy to discuss making magical or geogamic seals that capture the energy of significant celestial objects. So if you want to explore this more, um, 
Of course, you might want to look at Elias Ashmole's Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum. Um, Orboros Press had a really nice reprint that corrected some of the, the typos from the original one done almost 400 years ago. You can also look at the original because it's online at archive.org. I'll put that uh, link below also. Um, the compound of alchemy has been, uh, has was put out in an ed edition by Stanton Linden. And then these three works by Rampling are must reads if you are studying physical alchemy. I mentioned the first one in this article. I've talked about her book, The Experimental Fire and other videos. And this bottom one is the one that discusses the dissemination of works uh, by George Ripley in Bohemia in Central Europe in places basically where John Dee and Edward Kelly were after Kelly's reported success with the Philosopher's Stone. And it focuses not only on the compound of alchemy, but also his bosom book. So John Dee and the Alchemist practicing and promoting English alchemy in the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to the hieroglyphic monad, but there is some things for you to explore in terms of physical alchemy, if you're interested. So have a great day, bye-bye.